people are just bored with their everyday life. Let's just go there and see what's going on. Amen? Others were saying, I need a healing, and I heard this guy's a healer. Let's go follow him for that reason. Other people said, you know what? I heard that he, he supernaturally created loaves and fishes. I'm hungry. Let's go follow him. There are all kinds of reasons that people, you know, are interested in church or interested in the kingdom or interested in Jesus. And these great multitudes were an example of that. But it says that he turned and said to them, verse 26, If any man or any person come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yes, even his own life, also, he cannot be my disciple. Hallelujah. Whoa. Jesus kind of had a way of, you know, just putting it out there where everybody went, boom! What in the world is he talking about? And don't let the word hate here throw you. If you study this in the, in the original Greek, it means to love less than. He wasn't saying to get into hatred and resentment towards somebody. He was saying, if you don't love me more than you love anybody or anything, even yourself on this earth. Now notice what he said here. How many of you are glad Pastor Purcell didn't write this scripture? Yeah. Pastor Purcell's glad he didn't write this scripture. Yeah. He says, you cannot be my disciple. Now, let's just define this a little bit because... People read this and they start getting scared. Oh my God, I did something selfish this last week. I must not be saved. He's not talking about being saved here. He's not talking about being in the covenant here. He's talking about being a mature, spiritual person. That's what a disciple is. Yes. And I might add, discipleship is a process. Yeah. You know, there are three Greek words that have to do with... Uh, uh, What's, what would be the word to describe that? Maturity or whatever. One of them means infant, an infant. The other one means toddler. When the, 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 the wise men came to Jesus to bring him the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, it, the, the word that's used to describe Jesus at that time was toddler. Yes. And if you research and study that all out, it was probably about an 18-month journey from the time those those wise men in the, in the east, when they saw those different stars coming together that Daniel had told them about and how that was a sign that the king was born, and they loaded up their caravan and headed out, it was probably about an 18-month journey or so for them to get to where Jesus was at. And he wasn't, you know, I don't care what your Christmas card shows you, he wasn't this little infant laying in the manger that night when they showed up. He was a little toddler running around pulling the pots and pans out of the cupboard. <laughs> He was probably right about terrible twos. I don't know if Jesus had terrible twos, but anyway. And so there's that word that means toddler. And then there's a word over in Romans chapter 8. You see it over there. They that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. That word, if you look at it in the original, it means mature. See, a mature son of God is, has a relationship with God as a disciple and can hear from God and can walk as the Spirit of God leads them. That doesn't mean that God won't use a toddler or that God won't use a child. Uh, I remember Jaime's son, but I'm calling him Buddy, when he was just a little, what, seven, eight-year-old kid, whatever he was, God was using him in a healing ministry. Maybe he was younger than that. Four years old. Praise God. Out of mouths of babes and sucklings, God's ordained strength. God will use people at all ages. And I think we're going to be astounded in our day and hour uh, how he uses some of these little kids and some of these uh, younger people as well. But that doesn't mean they're a disciple. See, a disciple is about maturity. It's about walking. And, you know, it's about becoming like Jesus is in spiritual maturity. Amen. So he says here, he qualifies disciple, and he says, you're going to have to grow in the love of God, but you're going to have, your priority is going to have to be me. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. And then the next verse, he got us in pretty deep on verse 26, but verse 27 makes it even a little harder. <coughs> Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Notice he, he didn't say, 
Eh, they might not be able to make it. He said, you cannot. He drew a line in the sand, didn't he? Yeah. Now, hang on with me here tonight. This is going to get better, amen? We're going to get you in, but we'll get you out. Praise yeah. God. He says, they cannot be my disciple. Who does not bear my cross? We've had all kinds of things. Uh, people have said over the years, you know, that somebody will be sick. Well, I'm bearing my cross. No, you're not. Jesus bore your sickness, and you don't have to bear what he bore for you. The cross he's talking about has to do with the will of man versus the will of God. Amen? That's what his cross was symbolic of. Adam and Eve chose in the garden to say, no, we're going to do what we want to do, not what we know God would have us do. And their will crossed God's will. And that's what Jesus was, was bearing on that day when he died. He was taking upon himself that violation, uh, that sin that happened that infected the whole human race. And he bore the sins of men by bearing that cross. Right. Right. Amen. Yeah. So what is the cross that we bear? Very simple. I want to do what I want to do instead of what he wants me to do. Self-will. Or I'm afraid to do what he wants me to do. So I'm going to go do what I'm The devil uses lots of manipulation and tricks. He uses the spirit of fear a lot with us as Christians to manipulate us into doing what we want to do instead of what he wants us to do. Yes, sir. Look at your neighbor and say, hallelujah, I needed to hear this tonight. How about you? Yeah. Praise yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Now, Remember, this is a process. Jesus, when he called his 12 disciples, see, they were disciples before they were apostles. Apostle means sent one. That's a person you can trust. You know, if you had a business and you're, you're training a, a plumber to be a plumber, they're just a, a, an apprentice, they're not a journeyman, and there's certain things they don't understand yet, certain things they can't handle. You're not going to put them in the in the truck and send them out to do a job they're not ready for. You. You're not going to make them an apostle for your company right. until they're ready. Right. Until you know they're mature enough and, under, and have enough understanding to do that. Yes. Right. Amen. You're going to continue to make them a disciple as they're a disciple. You're going to continue to train them before you send them out. So by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit knew that Peter, he knew that John, he knew that these different men... In their heart, they had the kind of heart that said, I will be a disciple. Right. Once I find that truth, I am going to sell out to, commit to, and follow after that truth. Amen. Yeah. We know that's true because when Jesus walked up to Peter, James, and John, who had just had the most prosperous day of business they'd ever had, their boats were so full of fish they were about to sink, yeah. Jesus walked up to them and said, leave it all and follow me. They loved him. They were committed to him. Even though it may have been an, an immature love at that point, they were committed to him more than they were committed to the almighty dollar or shekel, I guess it was in Israel. Or they were even their family. They had to walk away from their family. They had to go out on this journey and fully and totally sell out and commit to follow Jesus. Amen. And that's what the Lord is saying here. He's saying that you're going to have to make a decision that I'm your priority. My will for your life is, is the priority. I was born again as a child. I was around 11 years old or so. And I got saved. I remember kneeling down in uh, Evangel Tabernacle down on Hedges Avenue in Fresno, California. After my pastor preached a message that brought conviction in my heart of my sins, I knelt down and prayed. And I, I, I asked Jesus to forgive me and to come into my life. And I felt the weight of sin lift off of me. I began to cry, not out of you know, fear or whatever, I began to cry just because there was something happened in me that I didn't understand and I just knew that, I don't know, it's just the love of God flooded my heart. Amen. I became a, a child of God. Amen. Amen? As a young child. But I didn't become a disciple until I was 29 years old. Amen. I was a kid in Sunday school causing trouble for the Sunday school teacher. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody remember Sunday school? Yeah. I was, you know, just a kid growing up, playing Little League Baseball, you know, doing the things that kids do. And, and I had a witness in my heart of the Lord. I remember walking home from elementary school. I didn't know what it was then, but I remember the Holy Spirit talking to me. He was showing me the, how the direction the world was going. And I just thought, well, everybody knows that. 
But I found out later everybody didn't know that. Yeah. Those who weren't born again had no clue that that was true. Yeah. But I was still immature, and I acted immature. I was still a spiritual babe. I was, you know, I, I, I wasn't mature, and I, I didn't understand discipleship. I just thought you got to be, a, you're a Christian, you got to be good. Right. <laughs> got to do things right. If you don't do things right, you're in trouble. Come on, are you here? Yeah. So I lived in this kind of this constant cycle of guilt because I couldn't do it all good. Right. Right. I didn't understand the grace of God. I didn't understand a lot of things that I understand now. Right. And actually, a lot of that misunderstanding on my part caused me to kind of walk away from the church. It wasn't so much that, you know, I was thumbing my nose at God. It's just that I felt discouraged because I didn't feel like I could match up. Yes. Right. And part of it was just me wanting to do what I wanted to do, too. Sure. Amen. I'm not going to blame it all on this church. I was wanting to do what I wanted to do in some, in some areas. And so it wasn't, you've heard my testimony, how at 29 years old, the Lord came and visited me in my truck and dealt with me about some things. And that day, I made a commitment to him, and I gave him my life. What I did was right here, what Jesus is saying. I said, from now on, whatever you're Lord in my life and whatever you say to me, whatever you want with my life, wherever you want me to be, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it as long as I know it's you. Even if I don't understand why you're you know, wanting me to be that or do that or go that way, I'm giving you my life. And I meant it with all of my heart. Yeah. Now, I, I haven't done it all perfect. There's been times when, you know, I gave him the driver's seat and I nudged him over and I took control again. Yeah, oh yeah. Anybody in here identify? Yes. But in my heart, see there's a difference in you being a human and making mistakes and sometimes just getting rebellious and sinning and giving it in your flesh or you in your heart having a, a hardened heart that's, that's established to go do your thing instead of what he's telling you. Exactly. In my heart, I wanted to serve him. I gave him my life. I made, I, I've made up my mind. I'm never going to quit on you, Jesus. No matter how much I mess up or this happens, I'm going to follow you till my last breath. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen? Amen. And so, uh, and I'm not using me as some kind of shining example of discipleship or whatever. I'm just telling you that there was a difference in me being this child of God in the kingdom, this toddler Christian, immature Christian, whatever, however you want to say it, and making a decision that I am going to grow up. I'm going to, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit discipline me, disciple me, and grow me up into the fullness of what He wants with my life on this earth. And I believe that's why Jesus here drew such a strong line. He didn't want people thinking, and we see a lot of it preached today. You know, there, you don't hear people talk about discipleship much anymore. They just talk about how good God is and how He, he forgives. And He does. And He's merciful. And He's more merciful than we are. He's great in mercy and all that. But there is, as Mike mentioned this morning, a price to pay to walk in what God has for you. Yeah. Not, not a price like Jesus paid. It's all legally yours. But you have to be willing to go through the process yeah. Yeah. for God to bring you into a place of maturity where He can make you a sent one. Yeah. He can use you at a level that He wants to use you at. Yes. Are you here? Yes. Now let's look here real quick. Verse 28. Jesus goes on to illustrate this through a couple of parables here. Verse 28. For which of you intending... Everybody say good intentions. Good intentions. <laughs> uh, we have them, don't we? <laughs> which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether you have sufficient to finish it. You know, if you were going to build your new house, you wouldn't just say, oh, let's just go build a house. You're going to find out, do I have the money to do this? Do I have a piece of land? Uh, am I going to be able to finish this job? Or am I going to get halfway through it and run out of money? That would be foolish, wouldn't it? Yes. Verse 29, less happily after he has laid the foundation. Everybody say, laid the foundation. <laughs> Lay the foundation and is not able to finish it, finish it all, that behold, it begin to mock him, saying, this man begins to build and was not able to finish. Now, he's talking about a life. He's talking about the fact that when you, you come into the kingdom, when you become a child of God, 
And God puts that foundation, his basic truths, you know, uh, the cross of Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, what makes you a Christian, those basic foundational truths that can never be changed. There's people trying to change them today and say they're Christians. It's impossible for you to change the virgin birth, the blood of Jesus, Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the life, and be a Christian. Amen. That's what makes you a Christian. Yeah. And we don't have time to get into that and, and talk about it. Now, some of the other stuff that we don't see and agree on, some of the minor doctrines and so forth, that's another thing. But these foundational truths. So he's saying here, don't be like a person. Don't think that you can be like a person who, even though you have that foundation, that you can just assume that you're going to be completed. You're going to be that completed temple of God. You're going to be that completed work of God. Right. Amen? Yeah. He says you need to count the cost. What is the cost? He just told us what the cost was. Everything. <coughs> it's free. It's free. But it costs you everything. Yeah. It's free. But it costs you your life. Yeah. But let me tell you. Just like Jesus said in another place. He said if you lose your life the way you want to live it, you're going to find a higher life than you could ever get here on your own. Amen. You're giving up the low life to find the high life. Yeah. Amen. It costs to be a Christian. Yeah, it costs all right. It costs you the, all the stuff the enemy is going to do through your life and to your life. But when you give Jesus your life, I know you'll get persecuted. I know the devil will come after you. I know you'll have to stand against the enemy. But praise God, when God's in you and he's in your corner and you're on his pathway, when we're preparing the way of the Lord like we sang tonight, the enemy can't stop us. Amen. And I'd rather have that peace and that joy and that knowing and that assurance that's in me than all of the money in this world. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes. Glory to God. Yes. So he says in verse 29 here, he says this, this life, let's just translate it into that, even though he's talking about building a tower, using it as an example here. Your life begins to mock you if you're not a disciple. You see people, you know, they're all, they're, they're born again, they're excited, they're zealous. Maybe they're even letting God use them. Maybe they're getting all their ex-friends up friends saved and all that. And they're go, 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 hallelujah, here we go, hidey ho. But they don't make the commitment they have to make, which means when you run into that place where it feels like the devil is right here and he's hitting you from every direction and even Christians are turning their back on you and you're confused and don't understand what's going on and uh, da 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 da. If you haven't made a decision to be a disciple and stepped into discipleship, at that point you're probably going to backslide, you're going to quit, you're going to go a different direction. And your life will become a mockery. Yeah. Your own life will mock you. Come on, are you here? Yeah. Now, we don't put people down like that. We don't attack them. We love them. We pray for them. We do what we can. The Bible says if someone falls, restore them. But what he's saying here is don't fool yourself. You better count the cost. And the cost is everything you are and have and everything in your life and your future. It must be in my hands because I'm the only one that can make this thing come out right. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. Yes. And then he gives another example, verse 31. Or what king going to make war against another king? How many of you found out when you became a Christian, you stepped into a war zone? <laughs> Amen. Amen. What king going to make war against another king? See, when you stepped into the kingdom of God, you immediately got drafted into God's army and he's sending you forth to make war against the enemy. Jesus warred against the enemy the whole time he was on the earth. The Bible says he came to destroy the works of the devil. Yeah. And from the time he was released into his ministry, he was making war against the enemy. Uh, every way, when he healed the sick, he was destroying the works of the devil. Amen. When he gave people wisdom, he was destroying the works of the devil. Yes. Amen. So there is that element of it. What king going to make war against another king? He sitteth not down first and consulteth. What's the Lord saying here? He's saying, you better think this thing through. Amen. Consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Now, <clears throat> we know that in the Lord, we've got the devil outnumbered. Yeah. 
Amen. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, at least two-thirds of the angelic uh, beings available. I mean, th there's no comparison in the kingdom and in God and in Christ and in his, his realm uh, of the enemy coming against us. But us by ourselves. See, you can be born again, but not utilizing the kingdom. You're out here trying to figure this thing out in your own mind. And you're going to try to, you know, be a Christian and be saved. But yet you're going to try to cause your life to be a success. You're going to try to win over the devil out of your own uh, abilities instead of allowing God to move in discipleship so he can release his complete kingdom uh, power and the angels and everything that's available to you against the enemy. So you're like this king that's got 10,000 and you're going against the devil who's got 20. Right. He says that man needs to sit down and decide whether he can win or not. Or else, verse 32, while the other, the one, the 20,000 guy, is yet a great way off. He's this 10,000 king, that's you, sends an ambassador or sends ambassadors and desires condition of peace. People who don't make a discipleship commitment and walk as a disciple eventually will try to make a peace treaty with the devil. They'll compromise. They'll give in. Why? Because they can't overcome him in their own strength. Right. right. It's like the Torah. Look, the Torah. The Lord told me. That's saying the Lord told at the same time. The Lord told me going down to somebody out years ago. He said, John, don't fool yourself. Whatever part of you I'm not Lord over, the devil is. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, God is who God is. Lord is who you have to let him be in your life. Yes. That's what we're talking about here tonight. A disciple is not just does not just know about God and know that Jesus is God and that has received enough to know that to, to be in his kingdom, to be one of his children. They're not just a, a, an immature young one. You know, a little, little kid, a little toddler, or even a little older, uh, you know, they can't be a disciple. First time you cross paths with them and, and you try to take their toy away from them, man, they're coming after you. They're not going to deny themselves. They're going to get ticked off that you've got their toy. Amen? So he's given us some examples here and saying, if you don't count the cost and, and totally get it where you're all in on this, you're sold out forever, you're committed, and you're willing, and this is a big part of it right here, you're willing to let the Lord tell you when you're wrong. God's never going to tell you as one of his children you're bad. But he will tell you when you're wrong. He loves us enough to show us the error of our thinking and our ways. Because he knows that if we continue to go in that compromising or that deceit pathway, the enemy is going to fool us and deceive us. And we'll end up either just throwing in the towel and backsliding and quitting. Or we'll make some kind of deal with the devil and live Half in the kingdom, half out of the kingdom, in the sense of where we walk as a, you know, as a Christian in the earth, yep. and you know, and it's not going to work. Right. Right. How many of you are still glad you came to church? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Verse thirty-three. Let's read this last verse, and then we'll get back to the good stuff. <laughs> Actually, this is good stuff. So likewise, whosoever he be of you. That forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Right. Jesus required those 12 disciples to forsake all they have. Yeah. Come and follow me, he said. Come and follow me. Remember the rich young ruler? Yes. He came to Jesus. You know, he was basically asking to be a disciple. And Jesus said, well, you know, keep the commandments and all that. And he, he told the Lord he kept the commandments. But he only kept the half of it. There was... Half of the commandments that had to do with what was it? Outward stuff, but not, but not the heart. My wife preached on this one time, and I knew she'd remember it. I didn't remember it that well. He 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 named the commandments that had to do with doing stuff out here, but he the other commandments were the heart issues. Right. Right. And so Jesus said, "Well." 
He said, just take all that money and wealth you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And he went away sad. Why? Because his heart, where your heart is, where your treasure is, is where your heart is. Right. If he had got rid of his treasure, and I'm not saying everybody needs to do that. Amen. Amen. Jesus told him to do that. Right. Because his heart was attached to that treasure. Right. He went away sad because his heart was attached to that and he couldn't right. become that disciple. Amen. Amen. Jesus was offering him discipleship, but he couldn't walk away from it. So it's pretty plain to see, at least for me here, why people get so far down the line with the Lord. And then they run into that place where they really do have to die on the cross. Yes. Like Jesus. They really do have to uh, stop and go, wait a minute. I'm losing the battle here. Mm -hmm. I'm being outnumbered here. God, I, you know, I need your angel armies. I need you to back me up here. I need you to lead me as my, as my uh, king and so forth. So let's go back over to John chapter 8. We got you in. Now we're going to get you out. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Father. John chapter 8 again. <clears throat> Let's look at this area of scripture again that we just looked at. Let's just go ahead and start at verse 30. He spake, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue... Now, the word continue here means to abide in, live in, dwell in. Right. If you continue in my word. Remember the, the time uh, Jesus was, you know, people were following him and, and they kept calling him Lord. And he said, why are you calling me Lord? Saying Lord, Lord to me. You don't do the things I say. Right. I may be God. I may be a lot of things to you, but I'm not your Lord. Because only you can make me your Lord by doing what I say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Hey, this is good news tonight. Now don't get this, don't get this religious perfectionism mentality about what I'm talking about tonight. Because we've yeah. all violated, we've all at times missed it. We've all at times, you know, maybe you've got a, a something in your life right now you're struggling with. And you know, and, and it just seems like you keep falling into that trap and you're having to believe God and have Him work with you to get you out of that habit or out of that whatever it is. Yes. Amen. 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 Come on, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a heart commitment. Because you know, Peter was a disciple. Right. Yeah. Right? right? We read about him in the four Gospels. He was committed and he was serious. I mean, you don't grab a sword and try to take on a whole big group of soldiers that are armed. Right. To stand and fight for Jesus if you're not a serious person. Right. And Peter, you know, he got great revelation as he was growing in his discipleship. He, he One day it dawned on him, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're that Messiah. You're that King Messiah that they've been talking about. You're him. Right. And Jesus praised him for it and told him, you know, you, you're operating in the characteristics of God. You're connected with the Father. You're moving in this thing. You're growing. You're changing. And then the, the turn, he turned right around when Jesus said something spiritual he didn't understand about the cross and tried to keep Jesus from doing the will of God in his life. So, pro, you know, discipleship is a process. But yet Peter, you know, when Jesus got up and said something that would offend every Jew in the world at that time, when he stood up at the end of his life and ministry and said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And those Jews do. The one thing you don't do as a Jew is you don't drink blood. And so they, it says many people left him and bailed out on him. Yeah. And he looked at the twelve and said, are you going to leave too? And Peter said, where do we go? You have the words of life. Yeah. Even though he didn't understand this, why Jesus would say such a thing... He, in his heart, he was committed as a disciple. And even though he was going to have to work through this thing, and we know what happened later when the cross happened, and he became discouraged because it didn't come out the way he thought it was going to. Yeah, right. He ended up in fear, denying that he even knew the Lord. And then he was ashamed of that, so he tried to run from that and go back to his old occupation. And he's out there fishing, and all the guys are out there fishing with him. And Jesus comes, shows up on the shore, and restores Peter and all of them back into ministry. And says, come on, let's move on in our discipleship program here. Yes, amen. 
Hallelujah. So we're not talking about somebody being perfect and never missing it. We're talking about a process. But what I see in the church, and like I said, here I am, been saved since I was like 11 years old and didn't become a disciple, I was 29. And you know what I did between 11 and 29? <clears throat> Run around pulling the pots and pans out of the cupboard. <laughs> yeah. You know, getting mad because you took my pacifier away from me. Blaming other people for all my problems. Yeah. I acted immature. I acted like a two-year-old. Yeah. Because I was. Yeah. And because people don't understand this concept, many people never move into that place that God has for them to grow them up into what He wants to use them for, not just in eternity, but here on earth. Amen. 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 I just have a feeling that there's going to be some discipleship schools going on in here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, this is not a guilt thing for us. No. But being a pastor and, and pastoring over 30 years, I have seen people come in and be a part of a local church that I, would, that I pastor. And I've seen some people be there many years, be a part of that church, hear the same word everybody else is hearing. See God heal people, see this happen, see that happen, and, in, and be there in the teens of years and never grow, as far as I could tell, never grow hardly at all. You know why? You've got to make that decision that you're going to die to you and live to him. And if, if everybody in the church turns their back on you, instead of you getting offended and running off and going and trying to do something somewhere, you used to go before God, what do I do now, Jesus? Do I stay here and endure this, or do I go do this over here? Right. Yeah. And if you don't have that kind of a mindset about it, the devil will lead you around by your nose, by your offended emotions, or whatever he can work in your life. Come on, are you here? Yeah. And you'll never, you'll, you'll live and die on this earth a baby Christian and go to heaven as a baby. I don't want to do that. I want to be like Jesus. I want to finish his, my course on this earth. I want to be able to say, Lord, I glorified you on the earth. I was at least uh, aware enough to grow up a little bit to where I could be a sent one in some areas and be used of you to fulfill the purpose you put me on this earth to fulfill. Yeah. It's not about me being glorified, somebody thinking I'm something wrong, a hot rod for God or something like that. It's not about that. It's about me being able to be more like Jesus. Right. Amen. And really, that's what he's, he's wanting us to be. He says, things I do, you're going to do. Well, for us to do the things he did, he's not just talking about healing the sick and raising the dead. That's part of what he did. But what he did was he walked around as a mature spiritual man anointed by the Holy Ghost and defeated the devil and put him in his place and did a work on behalf of others that helped people come into a place that God had for them. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Are you here? Amen. Yeah. Amen. So back over here in John 8. <laughs> if you continue, you've got to make up your mind right there. I, in 1979, I made up my mind. I am going to be in church. I am going to, I'm going to ask God where to go to church. I'm going to ask him what to do. And whatever he says to me, I'm going to do it. Yeah. And I have never gone back on that decision. Like I said, I've violated that decision at times in, in having a, a, you know, a flesh fit. Come on, you ever had a flesh fit? Yeah. How many of you ever heard, it's been years ago, but Jesse DePlanis used to preach a message about a chocolate cake. Anybody ever hear that? that he was talking about a fit of the flesh. How that him and his wife just went nuts one day and ate a whole chocolate cake together or something like that. And it's pretty fun. Of course, Jesse DePlanis is funny anyway. He's got an anointing that's funny. But we've all had our little flesh fits. <laughs> Come on. That's, That's happened. But see, I look out here and I see people. People that I've had intimate relations in the in, in counseling and talking with them and, and you know and know some more about your life than maybe other people or whatever. And I see you through the test of time and the years and the attacks of the devil that came against you, the discouragement and and all this stuff that happened. Here you are on Sunday night. Here you are still in the same church. Here you are after the devil gave you 3,000 reasons to quit this church. Amen. 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 Yes. I guarantee you, you'll get offended at me sooner or later. 
If I'm your pastor, the devil will see to it you get offended. Okay. He does not want you with the pastor you're supposed to be with. And he'll show you, brother whoever, or sister whoever, somewhere else, oh, they're wonderful. <laughs> and I'm not saying they're not. I'm just telling you, that's the way it works. Yeah. Are you here? Right. Amen. So we have to always go to God. The bottom line of being a disciple is always checking with them. What did you say about this? Yeah. And you know what? If he doesn't say anything, it's like Mike was saying this morning. You probably already got the answer, so just keep doing what you're doing. Go as much by what God doesn't say as what He does say. Amen? Amen? So He says, if you continue, if you abide in My Word, what I say to you, what I show you, what you understand when you read the Scriptures, live in it, be it, become a part of it. The word belief to a Jew doesn't mean, uh, yeah, I, I mentally assent to that and agree with that. No, it means you believe it, so you're living it. Amen. Faith without works is? Yes. Yeah. He says, then you become a disciple. When I made that decision in my work truck that day in 79, that I'm going to follow him no matter what. I'm going to be where he wants me to be. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. I became a disciple that day. Hallelujah. I was a young disciple. I was wet behind the ears disciple. I was green as grass disciple. But I became a disciple that day. And then he says, and you shall know this discipleship process that I'm going to work in your life. You shall know. And this word know, it literally, <clears throat> it literally means, let me just, I, I wrote down some of the definitions here. It literally means uh, to perceive, to be aware of, to know absolutely. Yeah. I like that part. Good. To be sure. Yeah. And it, it means to become one with. As I said earlier, what happens is you begin to get revelation and you begin to be an expression of the one who lives in you. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He begins then to be able through his word by his spirit to ex begin to express himself yeah. through you. Yeah. You become one with him. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that Jesus in John 17 rejoiced over when he was getting ready to, we're going to be one. Man, when I do this cross thing, you and I are going to be one spirit together. I'm going to be able to live my life through you. Hallelujah. Disciples. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Praise God. He says you'll know the truth. You'll become one with the truth. You'll, you'll live in truth. The enemy won't be able to play all these deceptive games with you anymore. That's, you know, it helps you understand as you read the Gospels where Jesus would teach these multitudes of parables and the disciples would say, why are you teaching them parables? Because it doesn't matter whether I teach them plainly or in parables. They're not going to get it anyway. Why? Because they were there selfishly to get something for them. They weren't there to be a disciple. Right. And we still see it today. You get some anointed minister that God's passing out healing through or doing something through. They show up by the thousands and praise God for it. There's a place for it. That's where they can get taught the word. That's where they can get that conviction of the Holy Ghost and the demonstration of God that he's real so they can begin to become a disciple. Right. But a lot of them don't do that. They got their loaf and their fish and their healing and they're out of there, dude. Come on, are you here? I mean, we, we minister to them here in town. Uh, I don't want to get too far off on that. <laughs> it says you'll know the truth. You'll start living the truth. I, when I started going through this process, God started, man, he started, because finally I opened my heart up enough to where he could show me some light. And I started seeing things that I had believed and things that the devil had me just deceived about and I thought oh my god what in the world have I been doing here and I went through it first I kind of went through a guilt thing over it you know and this and then you know, he finally got it over to me look you know <laughs> there's no use in doing that you're not going to make progress living in the past yeah. and all of that but he began to reveal light to me and I began to be able to walk in truth now truth is progressive the truth that I'm walking in now I wasn't walking in even five years after I became a disciple. Right. Truth is an unveiling. It's a, you, you'll know, you can look at script, I can look at scriptures now that I looked at back then. 
and I saw a certain thing in him, but now I look at him and I see something totally different because God is elevating and causing us to know and to grow in truth. Amen. 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 But he says, you'll know the truth and that truth that you're walking in is going to, I like the word, make you free. We try to struggle through human effort to be free. I'm not going to do that anymore. Oh, yes, you are. If it's got you and you don't have it, you're going to do it again. Yes. I guarantee you, whatever avenue, whatever pathway the enemy's made into your life in deception, and he's got you in that trap, he will expound upon that. He will use that. He'll do that again in your life, and you'll fall into it until you come to a place where the truth of God begins to work in you in such a measure that you're able to cut that off, shut that down, walk with God in a place of freedom. Hallelujah. Because the truth is making you free. Amen. See, that's why people who refuse to be a disciple, that's why I've seen them. I've seen them 15, 16, 18 years, and they're, they're the same person spiritually that they were when they walked in the door 18 years ago. And I, there again, that's, I'm not attacking it. I'm not putting them down. It's just a fact. There are some people that never grow up. Even in the natural realm. I love you. Praise God. He says you'll know the truth. And the truth will make you free. This word free here in the original Greek means to liberate or to deliver. Glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Now let me just share this as I close right now. I'm breaking records tonight. I'm putting by about 730. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Some of you have been praying, huh? Get us. Paul, get us. Get us the beer company or get us the, Oh, the world. I watch commercials. I know that. Amen. We're breaking. Some of you have been praying. God discipled him in time. You know? yeah. <laughs> now I forgot what I was going to share. <laughs> Let me wrap this up with. <laughs> oh, now I remember. Now I remember. The days ahead of us. Now I, I don't have a, you know, this, I haven't had this big apocalyptic vision or anything like that. But you know, the Bible says the Holy Spirit shows you things to come. Yes. Yes. And He'll have you even a general sense, gives you a general sense of things. I believe that in our nation, that in this process of God shifting our nation, we're coming into a time of, of conflict. There's conflict going on right now, but it's mostly just a bunch of yang, 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 yang right. stuff. <clears throat> but uh, the enemy is not going to want to give up this nation. Right. He doesn't want to do it. And he's going to pull every string he can. He's going to try to manipulate any, any nation he can. And I don't know. I'm not saying we're going to have a war. I'm not saying this is going to happen. But I, I, I believe I do know this. Pressure is going to come to the church some way, somehow. It's already here in some ways. But pressure. Pressure to do what? Pressure to not be a disciple. Pressure to step back instead of step forward. Don't think that... David's flesh standing and looking at Goliath that it was just this flippant easy thing for him to do. I guarantee you his flesh was telling him hey you dummy, you better not hit that dude. Come on. And of course the devil was prophesying through Goliath to him. Goliath was a false prophet. His name would mean soothsayer. He had, there was actually spiritual power, demonic anointing on his words with the spirit of fear anointed to blast David with that fear to back him off. Yeah. Yeah. But David had already made up his mind what he was going to do right. and who he was. Yeah. And he yielded to the process. Yes. Instead of getting mad at his dad and right. doing whatever, he, he yielded to the process. He began to minister to the Lord and the Lord said, we're going to do some lion and some bear killing here in a few days. Yeah. <laughs> And you're going to know me. You're not going to just know about me. You're going to know me. You're going to experience me. That's good. 
You're going to be able to hear from me. Yeah. I'm going to use your mouth to, to sing psalms and prophetic things. Matter of fact, I'm going to anoint you so much that you're going to set up this ministry called the Tabernacle of David. And people are going to receive the impartation of that anointing from you as the sweet psalmist of Israel. And when they lift their voice, there's going to be this harmony of God, the sound of God that goes out and completely captures the atmosphere of the nation. To where when the enemy gets mad and tries to attack, he'll fail every time. And the blessing will be on the nation so much. I'm going to pile up wealth through you to where you can finance the, the great temple for your son. Amen. 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 Wasn't it an easy time and an easy day? But David was a disciple. Amen? Yes, he was. Yeah. And I just really believe that, that God, even maybe tonight, one reason I'm preaching this, is He wants us to make sure that when He drew that line in the sand like Jesus did and said, here's when, how you, when you can be and here's when you cannot be, my disciple. Yeah. To make sure we're on the right side of that line. Yeah. Because disciples, like the 12 disciples that became the 12 apostles, are going to do great things. Amen. You say, well, yeah, but they gave their life and martyrdom, all of them except John. They did. Right. But they knew they were going to need to. Yeah. You know, uh, if you study the Bible, you find most people who are martyrs in the Bible already knew ahead of time they were going to need yeah. to do that. Even yeah. Paul. Paul said, the Lord showed me it's time for me to check out of this place. And then I'm going to die and spill my innocent blood. That's kind of like punching the devil in the nose one more time as you leave. Because when that innocent blood is left on this earth, God looks at that and goes, uh, Devil, you just spilled some more innocent blood. I'm going to hold you accountable for that. Come on, are you here? Yeah. So being a martyr is not the worst thing in the world. Hallelujah. Instant death, instant glory. And I'm not saying we all ought to run out and become martyrs. Nope. Don't talk yourself into being a martyr. Nope. No. You let God lead you in your life. But we can become spiritual martyrs. Yes. We can die to ourselves every day. Yes. Yeah. Paul said it this way. I die daily. Yes. He wasn't talking about, you know, oh, the devil's right around the corner and I may get killed any day. He was talking about, I live my life making sure that I die to me and live to him daily. Basically, he was saying, I'm a disciple. Amen. Amen. So, Father, I thank you tonight. Thank you for the day we live in. We're so thankful for all the blessings you've given us and all the goodness that we have. I'm thankful for this nation, Father, that you allowed us to live in. When I watch television and I see some of the circumstances that people live under in the Middle East and Africa and in some of these other places, Lord, even out just outside our borders, Lord, I'm thankful for the blessing that's been on my life and for the blessing on this nation. But God, you called us to be that light to those nations. And Lord, maybe there's people here tonight that you've ordained that they become a sent one and they even go over to a foreign nation and they plant your kingdom there and they establish. We're going to have next Sunday, we're going to have a man who used to be a part of a motorcycle gang who was selling drugs and you reached out and you took hold of him and sent him to the to the great Far Eastern nation to be that apostle. And he's established your kingdom in that nation in many areas. God, I thank you for that. I thank you. Lord, we commit ourselves to you. We're not going to try to be like you. We're going to yield to the process of the Holy Spirit to turn us into being like you. And Lord, if there's any area where we've backed away from discipleship, or we've signed a peace, tried to sign a peace treaty with the devil. Or we haven't counted the cost. Maybe we've got that foundation in our life. But you're saying, I want to build a glorious temple. I want you to show forth my glory. I want you to be part of the glorious church. Lord, we commit ourselves tonight to you. We recommit ourselves. I committed myself back in 79. But I commit myself once again this night publicly Amen. to serve you, to yield to you. Amen. And to let you do what you want to do. In my spirit, soul, body, in my family, in my social relationships, in my finances, God, I yield it all yes. into your hands. Yes, Lord. For your glory, Father. Yes, Lord. And I thank you for it, Father. Yes. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. God, I pray that this fellowship, and even Madeira, of course, that all the fellowships, if possible, that it be a, a shining light 
God, let us shine. Let us be those disciples where your light shines through us. Your healing power flows through us. Your encouragement. Your character. The fruit of the Spirit, Lord. Let the fruit of the Spirit be developed in our lives. And may people, when they see us, they're just aware that Jesus is in us and that we've been with Jesus. May he be glorified in all that's said and all that's done. Give you praise. Let's just praise him for a minute. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. You know, a couple weeks ago, I already shared this, but a couple weeks ago, the Lord, I was listening to a reading a word on the Elijah list, and the Lord just put some scriptures together. I got this revelation about holiness. Holiness is not something God does, it's who he is. He's it's who he is in his character and his being. He's agape. He's totally separated unto agape. And he told me, he said, John, the way to be holy is by being with me. So that what's in me and on me gets on you. You're not going to try to earn holiness by trying to do better and be better. We always ought to try to do what's right and do good works. Amen. But at the same time, the change that takes place in us is because he changes us. Yeah. And as we commit to be that disciple and we meet with him and we listen to him and we follow after him, then he's going to impart himself into us in fullness and maturity. And we'll be who he's called us to be. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Well, let's stand tonight. Glory to God. I almost made it. Went a little bit over. Can't call the Guinness Book of World Records, I guess. Does it help you tonight? Yes. I really feel this was from the Lord for us. Just take it home. Just, just take it home. Maybe look the scriptures up again or watch it again on our YouTube channel or whatever. And just, just say, Lord, what does this mean to me? I'm not going to try to figure it out in my mind, but I'm asking you to just help me to walk in that place you have for me. Father, we thank you for our opportunity that you've given us to be a part of Madeira and all that's going on. Exciting, Lord, to know what you're doing in our day and hour. I pray for every family that's represented here tonight, every person on the internet that's watching or will watch this. God, I pray that that home will be a, a, a home of disciples, of people who walk with you in a place where even when the enemy tries what he tries, he'll not succeed. And the glory of God will be demonstrated and testified about for eternity because of people willing to lay their lives down for you. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name.